I encourage you to take your copy of the scripture, however you may have it, and turn to the 16th chapter of Luke's gospel as we continue our study that you may know the truth about Jesus. We're going to be in verses 14 through 18 this morning. Let me ask you a question I will not do as my brother Max did a moment ago and asked for a show of hands, but let me ask you how many of you have ever gone through the day with something on your face that you did not know about, or maybe something in your teeth. Maybe you had a wonderful chocolate eclair, the breakfast of champions for breakfast, and you are not a heathen barbarian. You wiped your mouth with a napkin, but you missed some chocolate that got on your cheek, and you didn't know about it, and you went through the day Joyful about the morning. After all, you had a chocolate eclair, right? And then, all of a sudden, you notice it in the bathroom mirror. Or maybe, maybe you woke up one morning early in the dark and you wore two different colored shoes. Maybe that is what happened and you did not find out about it until a faithful brother brought it to your, your attention, right? Well, the mirror, or the faithful brother, doesn't lie. It reveals in us what is truly there and what is required of us. And so it is with God's law. It shows us who we really are. Those things that we would not otherwise see about ourselves. It pulls back the curtain that we erect over those part of our lives that we would rather not be seen. And then God's law does what all laws do. It shows us the consequence of violation. And unlike human laws, there is no way that we can violate God's law without him knowing or without there being a consequence. For God is perfectly just and he cannot overlook or dismiss sin. And the worst part of this is that the law also reveals that all of us have violated it. And to violate even the smallest portion is to violate it in its entirety. There is nothing we can do to make reparation for our guilt before the law. Nothing we can do. But that doesn't mean that there isn't anything someone can do. That is the good news, that although there is nothing we can do, the only one who could do anything for us came proclaiming the gospel and laying down his life for us. That one is Jesus, the name we sang about, the one who is worthy, the son of God, the king of kings. And in him, the law is fulfilled. In him, we have forgiveness for sin and salvation. And in him, we can understand the right relationship between the law and the gospel. And so I'll ask if you are able to please stand with me this morning as we read God's word. Luke writes, beginning in the 14th verse of the 16th chapter of the gospel that bears his name, the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things, and they ridiculed him. And he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were until John. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached, and everyone forces his way into it. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, and he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. Oh Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for sending Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, that he may die on the cross for us, and that we might have salvation through him. Lord, as we come to these words in your word, I pray that we, we hear them, that we apply them in our lives, and that we see what the balance is between your law and your gospel, not ignoring one or the other, but living in the light of both. 
We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in the 15th chapter of Luke's gospel, we saw Jesus respond to the grumbling of the Pharisees and scribes when they saw that he was hanging out with the sinners and the tax collectors. And we saw at that point that Jesus responded to their grumbling by telling three parables that illustrated God's extravagant joy and pleasure in seeking and saving the lost, right? We saw that in the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the prodigal son. Then in the opening verses of chapter 16, we saw Jesus then turning to his disciples and teaching them how to shrewdly use their wealth for the advancement of God's kingdom. He wanted them to understand that, that they were to plan and to use their wealth as a matter of faithfulness and to keep a careful watch over their hearts so that money did not become their master, but rather that they remained the master of their money. And while those teachings were directed to the disciples, the Pharisees were there on the fringes. That's where they liked to hang out when Jesus was around. They liked to be on the edge. They weren't there to hear what the Lord had to say. Their hearts were hardened. But they were there to try to catch him and to, to bring dishonor on him. And as a result, Luke tells us that upon hearing Jesus' teachings about our wealth, they ridiculed him. The Pharisees ridiculed him. And Luke doesn't leave us hanging as to what prompted their ridicule. He tells us they were lovers of money. You see, their ridicule re revealed in them idolatry. Now, this idolatry was first evidenced by money, their love of money. And there's an irony here. When we consider that Jesus had been teaching his disciples about wealth and how we're to use it and how we're to employ it and plan with it for the advancement of God's kingdom. And, and Jesus told his disciples in verse 9, he said, And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into eternal dwellings. So Jesus is saying, use your wealth to make friends among the world that you may help them come into the kingdom. And the Pharisees said, no, we'd rather, rather than using our money to make friends, we just want to be friends with our money. That's all we want. We want that. And so as a result, they turned up their noses at Jesus. That's the literal rendering of the Greek here. They turned up their nose at him. The Lord had hit close to home. He had stepped on their toes, so to speak. And despite all of the Pharisees' outward posturing of spiritual uh, uh, righteousness, they wanted people to see that, and they wanted people to think that they were pious. But the throne of their heart was dominated by their love of money. They believed that in the accumulation of wealth, they could display God's favor on them. They, they believed that if they just had wealth and resources, that that demonstrated to the world that they were living right and that God was pleased with them. You see, they were not different than Job's friends. You remember Job's friends. They came to Job and they said, Job, there is a one-to-one -one correlation and relationship between how you live and, and what you get in this life. If you are living righteously, God will bless you. And clearly, Job, for a while, you were living righteous because look at all the wealth you had. But you messed up. You messed up bad, and God took it all away. Divine earthly retribution, one-to-one, -one, right? If you thought prosperity theology is something that has only come around lately, it's been around since the beginning. Remember, there's nothing new under the sun. You see, this is nothing short of the self-justification of the self-righteous. Jesus saw through the Pharisees' hypocrisy and idolatry. He noted that the Father was also not fooled by the outward workings of their self-righteousness. He said, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. 
For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. And here we see that the Pharisees' idolatry, their idolatrous heart, was not simply focused on mammon, on wealth, but it was also included in the adulation of people. They wanted people to see them and glorify them. Martin Luther put it well. He said, idolatry is not only the adoration of images, but also trust in one's own righteousness, works, and merits, and putting confidence in riches and power. That is as much idolatry as having a carved image. Often when we hear the word self-righteous, right, we, we think of the the smug, arrogant, chest-puffing individual, don't we? We think of the Sister Bertha better than yous, right? If you're not familiar with that name, then you don't know church history very well. There was a great moment. Uh, it is often referred to as the Mississippi Squirrel Revival. If you haven't heard that, then go look it up on YouTube later. But anyway, uh, here's what I want to get a part, get a through to you. Self-righteousness is not always discernible on the outside. It might be, but it doesn't have to be. You see, what makes us self-righteous is the attitude of our heart. It might look like sincere piety, but it comes from a heart that is more concerned with pleasing people than it is to humbly submitting to Christ's rule in our lives. And Jesus warns the Pharisees that God knows your hearts. This is not mere theoretical knowledge of our hearts. This is not just an academic understanding that this is human nature. This is the deepest, most intimate, most personal, and most thorough knowledge of who we are as individuals. And God has that for every one of us. Not just humanity, broadly speak, speaking, but he knows my heart and he knows your heart. He knows your deepest desires. He knows what you're thinking. He knows what you're feeling. None of us are exempt. None of us are hidden. And none of us can fool God. That's why whenever I hear someone declare, only God can judge me, I shudder at the hubris that's being expressed there. Because it is true, only God will judge but that should make us tremble, not strut around like a peacock reveling in our sin. But the Pharisees' desire to receive the approval of people rather than seeking to please God meant that they ultimately rejected true righteousness. Because you see, if their hearts had desired true righteousness, godly righteousness, they would have wanted to see the lost be found by God rather than condemning them and grumbling at the Savior who seeks them out. They would have sought to use their money to help those in great need, rather than just giving a pittance of their wealth, tossing it into the buckets to make a large sound. Uh, but it was really out of their abundance, not out of what they actually had. And they most certainly would not have been exalting in what God saw as an abomination. You see, the Pharisees made a mistake that is endemic to the human heart. They had begun to think that what God loves is what we love. That's what we do so often. We think God loves what we love. But we know from God's word two things. Our thoughts and feelings and desires, those things that we love, can be deceitful. In Matthew 15, 19, Jesus says, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. It's just scratching the surface. But we also know that God's ways and thoughts are far different than ours. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declared the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So how can we know? How can we know if we have allowed our own desires to supplant in us that which God desires? Simply put, it is by testing our desires with the word of God. 
because it is the only infallible revelation and measure of what God approves. John Piper said it well when he said that our emotions are gauges. They are not guides. Do you see the difference? It's a gauge, not a guide. We can't go to our emotions and say, well, just because I feel this way, it must be right. God must be approving of it. No, we must go to the word and test it by what he has revealed to us. And when we test our loves, the things that we love in our lives, when we test it by God's word, then we will see whether our heart's desire is that which is exalted among men or that which pleases God. Because at the end, in chapter or verse 13 of chapter 16 here, Jesus said, no servant can serve two masters. You will either hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. If our desire is to be admired by people, we will reject true righteousness and we will adopt self-righteousness. It will be the faulty focus of the Pharisees here. And we would be wise to remember that when we focus on self-righteousness, it is an abomination in the sight of God. Is there any hope for us, given that our hearts are so inclined towards those evil things that Jesus described in Matthew 15, 19? There is. It's the good news that the kingdom of God has come. It is what Jesus himself preached, the good news of the kingdom. You see, according to God's perfect and, uh, plan and his perfect time, the second person of the Trinity took on flesh. He was born of the Virgin Mary. We are about to celebrate the Advent season when we remember that God with us came. Emmanuel, he was born in that manger in Bethlehem. And then he lived a perfect life in fulfillment of God's law. And he went to the cross to pay the debt of our sin. And he was raised again on the third day, conquering death so that we might have eternal life through him. That is good news indeed. Amen. This is what Jesus has been doing throughout his ministry. He has been preaching the good news that the kingdom of God has come. And up to this point, Jesus notes that the law and the prophets, that's a common term used to describe the entirety of the Old Testament. That was what was proclaimed prior to his arrival until John, and, and he's speaking of John the Baptist here. You see, in the law and the prophets, the whole Old Testament, God had promised that he would enter into a new covenant with those who put their faith in him. Let me show you just two examples of this from the prophets. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 33. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. The prophet Ezekiel spoke of this as well in the 36th chapter of his book in verses 26 and 27. He said, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You see, as he approached the cross in those final days of his earthly life, Jesus made it clear to his disciples that his impending sacrificial death was to mark the establishment of this new covenant. Luke twenty two twenty, 20. And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. You see, the Mosaic law had blood. It was filled with sacrifices for sin, but they were shadows 
of the once for all sacrifice that would be performed by Jesus on the cross when he shed his precious blood for us. You see, those sacrifices of all of those animals did not atone for our sin. How could they? The author of Hebrews points this out. He says, how can the blood of bulls and goats cover the sin of humans? They can't. And besides, even if they could, why would we have to do it year after year after year after year? No, those are shadows. They're pointing to something greater. So the law shows us both our need and our inability to meet that need. The good news of the kingdom that was being proclaimed was that the promised Lamb of God, of whom we sang, the Messiah, Jesus, had come to fulfill the promises of God and meet our greatest need of salvation and forgiveness by his death. And that which the Old Testament saints had looked forward to in faith had now come. The good news was being preached. And then Jesus says something about the kingdom of God that can be difficult to understand. He says, and everyone forces his way into it. What the Lord is describing here is the attack on the kingdom by those who wish to enter it by their own means, rather than by the means that God has established. And when we come to passages like this, this is, this is difficult it's a difficult one to understand. Everyone forces his way into it. I don't know about you, but I don't see people forcing their way into the kingdom of God. We didn't have to put up security at the doors of the church this morning to keep out the crowds, right? That's not the way that it seems. So what is Jesus talking about here? Well, let me, let me say, this is a great time to point out that when we come to difficult passages of scripture like this, it is imperative that we use what the reformers called the analogy of faith. The analogy of faith says that when we come to difficult passages of scripture, because all of scripture is harmonious and non-contradictory, we can go to other passages that are easier to understand to help us interpret the ones that are more difficult to understand. And so in this case, I want you to point you to Matthew eleven twelve. There Jesus said, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. You see, the good news, as wonderful as it is to the heart of those who have been regenerated, is repugnant to those who are still dead in their sin. Paul describes this relationship in his two letters to the Corinthian church. In 1 Corinthians 1.18, he says, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It's folly to those who are perishing, to those who are lost. And it is, it is wonderful to those who are being saved. And then in 2 Corinthians 2, 15 and 16, he says, for we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing to one, a fragrance from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. You see, the good news is repulsive to us in our lostness. For the same reason it was repulsive to the Pharisees. It declares that what the law says about us is true. That we stand condemned in our sin. It shows us that there is nothing we can do about it. And it shows us that we need a kinsman redeemer to save us. We can't do it ourselves. And so in response to that, the violent try to take, try to force their way into the kingdom. And how do they do this? By attacking the standards of the kingdom, by attacking the requirements to enter the kingdom. They demand that their own deeds be considered acceptable for entrance and they demand many ways into the kingdom. They want wide roads and many gates. And all of these attempts of people to force their way into the kingdom will fail. Because there is only one way to enter the kingdom of God. And that is through grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. John 10.9 says, I am the door. 
If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. This is Jesus speaking here. And then John 14, 6, a passage I know you're familiar with. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Did you notice in both of those verses the definite articles? The, not a, not an, not one of many, but the only, the exclusive way. One of the common criticisms of the exclusiveness of the gospel, that is that that there's only one way into the kingdom, is that it is unfair. That if God truly loved us, he would have provided many ways to heaven, many roads up the mountain to him, many doors to enter through. But I must tell you this morning, such a position is inherently unbiblical Because it presents a diminished view of the utter sinfulness of our sin, and it presents an inflated view of ourselves. As R.C. Sproul famously said, the question is not, why is there only one way to God, but why is there even one way? That is the truth. We are sinners. You see, it's offensive in our lost state to hear that what we deserve is not a wink and a nod from God overlooking our sin but that we deserve his divine wrath for all eternity. Because we hold ourselves in such high esteem, we naturally discount the awfulness of our sin. And we discount it by a number of ways. We call it a mistake. We call it a slip up. We might even call it ignorance. And if that is all that sin was then we would be justified in thinking that God was unjust and unfair and only offering one way through Jesus, if it's just a mistake. But I am here to tell you that Jesus did not come to die for a mistake. Jesus came to die for our sin. And what is our sin? It is rebellion against the Most High. It is cosmic treason against the Creator. And it is war that we rage against the sovereign who is perfect in all his ways and worthy of all our praise, worship, and adoration. When we come to understand by his grace the horror of our sin, which the law makes clear, we fall on our knees before him in awe of his amazing grace, which gave us only one way into his kingdom, only one. Again, grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. So what now is the place of the law in the kingdom of God? What is the, what is this? Are we still required to obey the strictures of the Mosaic law in its entirety? Have you ever heard the, the, what is a very common attack against Christians who point to the law and say that there are certain actions, behaviors, practices that are sinful And they say, oh, so you're going to apply that part of the law, but you're not going to apply the other parts, right? Do you eat shrimp? Yes, I do. I might be one of the reasons why Red Lobster had the problems they had. All right, I I like shrimp. I like shellfish. Do I wear clothing that is made of different fabrics woven together? Yeah, I do. I do. And so it's a common attack for people to say, oh, well, you're just a hypocrite then. If you're going to say that sexual immorality is wrong because it's against God's law, well, you're violating all these other things about God's law. How are we to respond to this? This is, let's be honest, this is a real question that is out there in the world. So what is it that's going on here? Well, I need to tell you that such criticism reveals an ignorance of the tripartite nature of Of God's law. What we mean by that is the law has three parts, three types. There is the civil law, there is the ceremonial law, and there is the moral law. The civil law was what was applicable to the ancient nation of Israel in a certain time and in a certain place. 
And it was designed to set Israel apart from all the other nations on earth. So when you read through the Mosaic law in the Old Testament and you see those criminal laws or, or the things that talk about how to settle judicious disputes, that's the civil law. The ceremonial law dealt with matters having to do with ceremonial cleanliness or, or ritual cleanliness. Right? If you touched a dead body, you were unclean and you had to go through this process to become clean again. That's the ceremonial law. Or how should the priests and the Levites carry out their duties in the temple of God? This is the ceremonial law. It described how the religion of the Israelites would be carried out. And then the moral law. And this is in contrast to the first two parts. Because the moral law predates the civil law and the ceremonial law. It goes all the way back to the beginning. It was established by God and it shows that God's standards are for all people in all places and at all times. His morals, his ethics apply everywhere to everyone. Now the civil law is no longer applicable because it was uniquely given to the ancient nation of Israel. That nation no longer exists. The ceremonial law has also been abrogated because Christ's work and sacrifice fulfilled all that the shadows it contained points to. We do not have to sacrifice bulls and goats anymore. We do not have to worry about being clean or unclean because we are now in Christ. But the moral law remains in effect. And it remains in effect because God's moral law is permanent. Look at what Jesus says. It is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. You know, we have seen in Luke's gospel his teaching against legalism. The Pharisees certainly struggled with legalism. Putting their own rules in place and acting as if those are the rules that God honors. But Jesus is now teaching equally so that we must guard our hearts against antinomianism, which is the belief that the law no longer, the law no longer applies in any way to believers. Listen, God's grace is distorted by both legalism and antinomianism. It's distorted by both. It's not just one or the other. We must be careful not to be fooled into thinking that our freedom from sin that comes in our redemption by Christ is freedom to sin. Our freedom from sin is not freedom to sin. In Romans, Paul addresses this very question. And he spends so much time showing us how we cannot be saved by the law and how it condemns us. And, and then at the end of chapter 5, in Romans 5, 20 and 21, he says, Now the law came in to increase the trespass. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Praise God. Grace. And it's as if he anticipated what the next question would be. In chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, he goes on to answer the question, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may abound? Well, if, if the increase of sin brings more grace, then let's sin more so we can get more grace. By no means. God forbid. How can we who died to sin still live in it? No, antinomianism is not right. The law still has a place. Knowing this, we see that the law is not the opposite of the gospel. That is sometimes how it's portrayed. The law and the gospel, they're, they're at odds and ends with each other. You have one or the other, but you can't have both. That's not what the Bible says. You see, the law reveals God's purposes that point to Christ, that are unveiled in Christ, and that are fulfilled in Christ. And as such, the law has been brought to its intended purpose in Christ and now provides guidance for us as believers 
in how we are to live our lives, how our spiritual and moral lives are to be led. I love the way that the Puritan Samuel Bolton put it. He said, the law sends us to the gospel that we may be justified. And the gospel sends us to the law again to inquire what is our duty being justified. Do you see that? The law shows us how we are sinners who cannot do anything for ourselves. It points us to the gospel, the gospel that says Jesus Christ died for you. We preach Christ crucified, right? And then once we have accepted that, once we have been justified by grace through faith in Christ, the gospel turns around and sends us back to the law to show us having been justified, how we then are to live. What a beautiful thing this is. And that brings us to the final verse of our chapter this morning or our passage, not the chapter, the passage. And at first it might look like, That doesn't fit. What is that one doing here? Did Luke just throw in a proverb from Jesus and it's supposed to stand alone? I don't believe so. I believe it fits perfectly well with what Jesus is saying here because it shows us it's an example of how the practice of the law takes place in a gospel-centered life. He says everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. This speaks directly to the moral law of God. It would have been a direct assault on what the Pharisees themselves taught. You see, the Pharisees had, for all their fastidiousness about keeping the letter of the law, right? I mean, they're, they're counting leaves of dill in order to tithe it. But they ignored the moral precepts of the law. They had lowered those standards, relaxed them. So while they kept the letter of the law, they had violated the spirit of the law. Let me give you an example of this about marriage. The rabbi Hillel taught that a man may divorce his wife if she burnt his dinner. You burn dinner, a man can divorce his wife. That's permissible. And, and the rabbi Akiva is even worse. He said that a man may divorce his wife if he found another woman more beautiful in his eyes than her. Do you see what's happening? This is the self-justification of the self-righteous. They were lowering the standards of God's law. What did God's law say about divorce? One man, one woman for life. That's That's not it. And Jesus, in fact, when he confronted the Pharisees on this matter later, he said, the only reason there's something in there is because of the hardness of your hearts. You wouldn't listen to God's law, God's moral law here, right? The Pharisees were making the law easier for themselves so that they might justify themselves in the eyes of man, not in the eyes of God. And so while there is important teaching here about marriage and divorce, The bigger picture is that Jesus is using the example of marriage to point to the relationship between the law and the gospel. He's showing us here that the practice of the law in the life that has been transformed by the gospel is to follow the precepts that God has laid forth. Those who have been saved by God's grace are not free to live apart from the moral law. We cannot do that. Do do you see the example of the Pharisees here? First of all, they reject the standards of God's law. They reject true righteousness. We've already seen that. And then they replace it with their own standards based on the desires of their sinful flesh. And they justify themselves before others relying on those created standards rather than on the eternal standards of God's law that are permanent and do not pass away. And their self-justification and approval from others assuages their consciences. And then, whenever they're confronted with it, they mock and they ridicule God's law. That's the Pharisees. But that's also us, if we're not careful. 
just as divorce does violence to those who experience it. And it doesn't matter if, it, if it's a biblically grounded divorce or not. Divorce does violence to everyone involved in it. It does. So too does trying to separate the gospel and the law in the life of the believer. Both have disastrous results. If you try to separate the law and the gospel, it is going to be disastrous for you in your spiritual walk. So rather than seeing the law and the gospel as enemies of one another, we should see them as allies, each teaching the same moral standards and used by God in our salvation. I'm going to close with one more quote from the reformer Martin Luther because I think it is a succinct and beautiful way to bring this together. The law discovers the disease. The gospel offers the remedy. The law discovers the disease, the disease of our sin. And the gospel offers the remedy, eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. And so this morning, if you've been struggling with that, if you've been trying to, to please God by what you do, rather than by what Christ has done, I encourage you, come down. We're going to sing a final song. Come down. Let me pray with you. Let us talk about that. But if you've been trying to get through this life, assaulting the kingdom of God, thinking you're going to get to heaven and use your own resume to get in, I have to tell you, you will find yourself on that day standing before the judgment seat of Christ and he will tell you, depart from me, workers of lawlessness, I never knew you. I plead with you this morning, do not step out of this life and into the next to hear those words. Instead, come today, come right now and surrender your life to Christ who is waiting to receive you. He takes pleasure and joy in finding the lost one who is found. Come, let's pray. Oh Lord, thank you. Thank you for your law and for your gospel. Thank you, Lord, that these are not antithetical to one another, but Lord, that they work together to, sh to bring about our great salvation. Lord, help us to see that the law points us to you, showing us that we cannot do anything to earn our salvation, but that we have violated it and that we have been in rebellion against you. But let it also then drive us to the gospel that says someone stood in our place and paid our debt in full. And that one is Christ Jesus, our Lord. Father, then having seen that, come back to the law and see then how we are to live. Father, thank you for this beautiful plan that you have put together. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.